Yeah, my name's uh, Klaus Leopold, and as you can probably hear, I'm not from the States. My accent is German, but if you talk to Germans, they don't understand me. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I I'm from Austria. So, and the title of my talk today is Why Agile Teams Have Nothing to Do with Business Agility. And, well, I, I just want to tell you a story. I just want to share a story with you. Um, this is a story of a, of a company, of an organization, and um, they were not really happy with their situation. So they wanted to improve time to market. Time to market was the thing in their environment because they were like, okay, we are not really proactive on the market. We are only reactive. So we want to become more proactive. The other thing is we cannot exploit opportunities because we're just too slow. And the other thing is, you know, there are these changes out there. Everybody probably heard about Internet of Things, Industry 4.0, Blockchain, AI, all these buzzwords. So we need to pre be prepared for this somehow. And then they were like, okay, we can do this. Let's go Agile, right? So if we become Agile, we can address all these um, topics. And they were like, yeah, we need to do this. So this was a company. Um, with a little bit more than 1,200 people or so, and roughly 600 people, they were like, okay, we need to do this agile transition now for these uh, 600 people. And that's what they did. So, how did they approach it? Well, first, they were like, okay, we need to have cross-functional teams. If you have ever read a, a book about agile, you will come across this line, right? Teams needs to be cross-functional. We need to have everything on board so that we can deliver value very fast. We can remove our dependencies. Everything will be great if we just have cross-functional teams. What else? They're also like, okay, we need to be organized by product. So one team is only working on one product, not multiple products. Again, smart idea in the end, right? What you're doing is you're removing dependencies. That's good. What else? Well, they are like, we don't want to be too dogmatic. Our teams can choose their favorite Agile method. So we don't care if they are doing Scrum, Kanban, whatever. Um, there are just some minimum requirements which these teams have to meet. Yeah? And these minimum requirements were visualization. Each and every team needs to have a board. right? So um, the idea was whenever you go to a team, you see what this team is working on, and you see all the blockers and everything that prevents flow and that prevents progress. Visual management kind of thing. Perfect. What else? They're like, okay, our teams need to do daily stand-up meetings. Daily stand-up meeting is a good thing. Fast feedback loop, right? So daily stand-up meetings for the teams. Um, then there's also the thing with retrospectives, improvements, right? So each and every team needs to do retrospectives because we want to become better. And if you do what you always do, chances are pretty high that the outcome is like always. So if you're doing something like retrospectives, you're becoming better. And they were also like, our teams need to do measurements because we need to see, well, are we actually making progress? Yeah? And if you see something like this, and you're a little bit into Agile, you would probably think, Awesome. Yeah, they really got it. I mean, that's what you need to do. No matter which textbook you open, that's what you need to do. And well, then they started um, their journey. Um, well, the first thing what they did is they came up with a 1.5 year transformation project. Do you see the irony a little bit? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much my humor, right? <laughs> Let's become agile. <laughs> the first thing we're doing is write the project plan. Again, chart. OK, but OK. Uh, <laughs> um, maybe we can talk about this a little bit later. So uh, what was on this, um, on this uh, project plan? Well, they were like, all our 600 100 employees, they need to become basic agile training. They were like, you know, agile, it's not so much about the practices. Agile is about the mindset. Have you heard this? Yeah, nice. So actually, it's about the mindset. And it's really important that all the people have the right mindset. Because if there's the right mindset, then nothing can go wrong. So mindset is important. So what they did is they came up with this 
one day agile mindset training. So 600 people <laughs> got this one day training and then they were like, okay, agile mindset, checked, right? <laughs> Done. <laughs> um, okay, um, what else? Uh, then they started this reorganization. You know, reorganization, uh, you basically throw a lot of people up in the air and then they land somewhere else in the organization. Yeah, and they landed in cross-functional product teams. Fair enough, good thing, because we're reducing dependencies, so it's not too bad in the end, yeah? Then, um, yeah, they implemented Agile on the team level. So what they did is training, of course. You know, all these teams that choose to do um, Scrum, they, need, they receive their Scrum Master training. You need to, to train the product owners, of course. Uh, for all these Kanban teams, they, of course, need to come up with some Kanban system. So they run quite a lot of these Kanban system design workshops. So quite a lot of training to do. Very good if you're a consulting company, yeah? So um, <laughs> in the initial phase, this whole transformation was um, supported by 16 external coaches, so it was some kind of ramp up, ramp up phase and then a ramp down phase, yeah, but 16 ex external coaches supported this uh, somehow, and you really need them if you see the program like this. 600 mindset trainings, you know, uh, 600 yeah. people <laughs> go through mindset training. If you package this in 20 per training, yeah, this is a day or two you can spend in training, right? And then all this stuff like product owners, scrum masters, and in the beginning they needed help uh, to, to facilitate the stand-up meetings and so on. So there's quite a lot to do for external coaches. But they were like, okay, we are not stupid. We build up internal capacity. So they also built up 11 internal coaches, which again, it's, it's, it's a smart thing to do because usually when there are the internal coaches or when the external coaches are here, then it's working. And if the external coaches are leaving, often people are like, okay, now we can switch back to normal. Yeah. You don't want to switch back to normal if you invest that much money, right? So um, not a bad thing actually. All right, so this was this 1.5 years uh, transformation project. Quite a lot to do, right? So after roughly a year or so, they were like 80% of all the teams were fully transformed. This was their language. <laughs> so I, I don't like this transformation kind of thing. <laughs> Sounds like a Borg starship. <laughs> you were fully assimilated. <laughs> Resistance is futile. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, these 80% they met basically the re the requirement. So they were working with these boards, visual management everywhere in place, stand up meetings. They were doing retrospectives, and um, what you could hear back from the teams, it was really like, okay, collaboration improved, collaboration and and communication within the team improved. So that's a good thing, right? Um, first conclusion. Perfect. Our transformation is on track. Um, but then there were the numbers. So can we also see this effect on charts? So these teams, they were doing measurements, right? So yeah, let's take a look at the measurements. And I would just show you um, two charts um, on the team level, um, which are pretty much representatives for many teams in their organization. So this is a chart of a scrum team, and it's the sprint velocity you see. So here, on the x-axis, you have the time, and on the y-axis, you have the fantasy, uh, sorry, not fantasy, uh, st story points, story points, sorry. Um, um, velocity, yeah. And um, what they were doing is, um, they, were draw they, were, they were drawing the trend of the velocity, right? So um, trend is actually a good thing to know, because it's often not about the, the singular measure, the singular event, it's like, how are we progressing over time, right? So I think your precedent is also not very good in trends. Yeah, today is very cold, so climate change is not happening. Yeah, so, no, it's the trend, okay, we're talking about here. <laughs> so, um, and the trend for um, the scrum teams, they were expecting a trend like this. So in the beginning, well, 
not a lot of velocity, of course. I mean, it's all new people and so. And then they, they are like, okay, there needs to be a steep increase in velocity. And then it's maybe not flattening out because we are constantly improving, but it's going down a little bit. But still, we need to see increase there because continuous improvement, that's what it's about, right? Okay, this was the actual result. And they were like, okay, interesting. So we anticipated something like this, but this is not good. It's actually going down the performance here, right? So they were a little bit puzzled. So, but it's not only about Scrum. So camp and teams, they set up quite a lot of these camp and teams and the camp and teams, they measured lead time. So here you see um, the work items and on the Y axis, uh, the lead time. Um, expected result was something like this. Lead time is going down, yeah? And the actual result was something like this. It's completely flattening out here and there's actually, you can't see any improvement, yeah? So they're like, okay, that's interesting. It's not what we expected, right? Um, we need to be a little bit careful if we interpret um, these charts because there was this reorganization going on. So you cannot compare these charts. This team did not exist before. So it's quite hard to compare to the situation before. Um, but there was one chart in this organization where they could do this comparison. That's this one, time to market of initiatives. Before they did this agile transformation, they did projects. Now they are agile, now they're doing initiatives. Okay, but in the end, it's just the same, right? So um, we can compare these numbers, but could we see? This was where their alarm bells rang because that was the actual performance of the time to market. So it was going up, not good. They were like, okay, now we are doing this huge agile transformation and we expect something like this. Guess what the result was? Something like that. <laughs> and that's really weird, right? <laughs> so they were like, what the yeah, phenomenon is going on here? So um, you could see it's going up. So they were becoming slower, although they did this huge agile transition. And that was um, the time where they basically called me. So they, they heard me talk about local optimization versus global optimization and all this stuff. And it's not about the team, it's about the system baby and so on. And they were like, okay, um, come to us and take a look, what, what do you think about this? And yeah, this was this information I had when I came to this company. And um, the good thing here is this company, there were really a lot of boards around. Each and every team, remember, that was one of the requirements, there was a board. So I could just walk to a team and start a conversation with them about their work. And what I could see here is boards like this. This is a very simplified team board. So what you could see here, something like our backlog, next, and maybe develop, and done. Maybe some teams had more steps here. But yeah, if you simplify it, it was pretty much like this. And this pattern also works for Scrum teams. So you have the product backlog, here we have the sprint backlog, that's what's going on in the sprint, and that's done, right? So what I noticed here is something like this, external weighting. So each and every team in this company had, um, maybe they, they, they've chosen different visualization, but there was always this situation like external weighting. So we cannot progress, we need to wait for another team. So that's good information to have. So I was like, okay, if you're waiting for another team, this would mean if each and every team in this organization is working with such a board, there needs to be a second board somewhere in this organization, right? And when these guys are waiting for external, this creates demand for this team, then this team is working on this stuff, and when they are done, this thing is unblocked and they can continue here, right? So that's what's going on when we see dependencies. And I was like, okay, nice pattern. So I started to go to the teams and started to ask them about what are your dependencies? Whom are you waiting for, basically? And I built some kind of dependency graph and the output was something like this. 
And you see eight teams here. So when we talk about 600 people, it's a little bit more uh, boxes and, and um, yeah, dependencies. Um, the question now is, why are there so many dependencies? I mean, they are working uh, in cross-functional teams. That's because you're doing, because you want to remove dependencies. They are working like in product teams. So one team is only working on one product. So where do these uh, dependencies come from? In theory, there doesn't have to be any dependencies, right? Because that's the reason why we did this whole reorganization. Well, multiple teams are working on one product. Maybe one team is only working on one product, but you need multiple teams that are working together on one product. Let's assume like these three teams, they need to work on one product. Of course, there are dependencies, right? Another thing was that the products weren't completely independent. I think you know this if you are working in an, in an environment with more than one product. If you do change something in this product, you need to change something in that product, in this product, and in that product, right? So you have dependencies among the products. And we're talking about 600 people. I've never ever seen in my life a knowledge working company with more than 30 people without dependencies. So um, yeah, in the end, it's somehow clear. And when, when I hear dependencies, there's always a picture popping up in my mind. Dependencies is something like a keyboard for me. Let's assume our organization is a keyboard and we are in the writing business. So what we are doing is we are writing um, letters or whatever for our customers. Right, so let's organize our company. Here we have team one, it's only hitting the one, two, three, four buttons, right? Um, team two, team three, team four. And now, there comes the customer. The customer wish is that we should provide a love letter. Yeah, we need to think of how we could do this, right? If you are in an organization where we're talking about 600 people, your reality is more like this. For each and every freaking key on your keyboard, you have a team. You see, that's a German uh, keyboard. We have a U team, and the A team, and the U team. Yeah, <laughs> you guys don't have these teams, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, you have an F team and G team. And now let's optimize all these teams, and let's assume it's working. You have the best F team on this planet. When they start hitting the F button, smoke is coming out of the keyboard. Yeah. How much faster can we deliver our letter? Not so much, right? So the point is when it comes to writing something on a keyboard, which is the highest or a very high form of dependencies, of course, it's not so important that you hit each key very, very fast. It's much more important that you hit the right key at the right time. This could be even a little bit slower, but if you press the right key at the right time, you can finish your letter much faster, right? Hit the right key at the right time. If we transfer this to our team environment, it's not so important that we have high-performing teams, that each and every team is working very, very fast. We need to make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time. That's where the performance is. Make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time. It's not about working fast. I never understood this high-performing team thing, but okay, that's another thing, that's me. Um, of course, I'm not smart enough to come up with something like this. There's a guy called Russell Eckhoff, and Russell Eckhoff says the performance of a system is not the sum of its parts, it's the product of its interactions. Yeah, so we heard this uh, quote today already. Yeah, <laughs> um, It's the product of its interactions. So it's not so important that each and every team is working very fast, it's more important that they are interacting very well. So if we transfer this to our Agile organization, we can say that agility of an organization is not about having a lot of Agile teams. Agility of an organization means that you have Agile interactions between your teams. You need to have Agile interactions between the teams. Make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time. And this was completely missing in this organization. No agile interactions. They, inter they optimize the single parts of the system, but this does not lead to a better system 
um, in the end. Yeah? So this was basically my first finding. No agile um, interactions between the teams. I will stay in the problem mode and then I will switch to the solution mode a little bit later because that was not the one and only thing I um, yeah, discovered in this organization. What else? Well, this is again a board, a team board, right? And um, I started to challenge the process here. So I was like, okay, so you are developing and when you are done with development, then you are done. They were like, yes, yeah, sure. You can read it here, right? <laughs> I was like, okay, um, so you're really done. They were like, um, well, maybe not really done. Of course, <laughs> we need to do some integration work. Okay, that's good information to have, so let's just put up another column on the board. We need to, we're waiting for integration. But after integration, you're really done. Well, yes, but, <laughs> you know, there's of course also this acceptance testing going on, so we need to wait for acceptance here. Okay, fair enough. But after acceptance, you're done. Well, if you ask it like this, um, <laughs> um, of course, <laughs> There's something like a release cycle, and we are releasing not uh, very frequently. So, but we need to wait for this release. That's good information to have when it comes to time to market, right? Then I ask them, okay, how often are you doing this integration, acceptance, testing, and so on? And they were like, yes. On a monthly basis, we are doing the integration work, and four times a year, we are doing the acceptance test, and we are releasing four times a year. We want to increase time to market. You probably see already something, right? Um, but I wasn't happy only with the downstream here. I also challenged the guys here in the beginning. So I was like, okay, um, you start development work here and before development nothing is going on. They were like, well, no. Um, <laughs> this is the development backlog. So before we start to develop, of course, we need to do some analysis work. Okay, fair enough. Let's try it. So we have a product backlog here, then you analyze, and then we are ready for development. And they were like, nah, no. Uh, actually, our process looks more like this. So we have a pool of ideas. Then we are doing a very quick triage of these ideas. Then we are writing a rough concept of the ideas. This concept is waiting for a steering committee. Then we are writing a detailed concept. And then this detailed concept is waiting for approval. That's good information to have again, right? So if you zoom out on this process, it looks like this. Yeah? Then we can again ask the question, how long does this take everything here? They were like, well, yeah, on a monthly basis we're doing this triage, uh, four times a year the steering committee is meeting, and twice a year we are approving um, our detailed concepts. We want to improve time to market, okay? <laughs> what did we find out? Here's development. Let's make development agile and <laughs> so fucking agile, you know, you can't believe it. Yeah? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> most likely not, right? <laughs> so there, there are some more levers to pull uh, when, you, when, you, when you work in a process like this. So this is maybe agile software de development, fair enough. But this has nothing to do with business agility. This company is as lame on the market as before. So <laughs> nothing changed at all, right? So this was uh, my second finding. There was no end-to-end -end management of the value creation chain. They zoomed in into the value creation chain, optimized this single part somehow, and then, uh, surprise, surprise, time to market um, didn't improve. Second finding, okay? Um, I found another one. Another typical team board, and what you could see on these boards, numbers. And numbers are a good thing, right? This is work in, process num or work in progress numbers. So um, they were working in a WIP limited system. And also the Scrum teams were working in a WIP limited system for two weeks. So they somehow set the scope for two weeks. And this is something like a, like a work in process limit. It's different, but still it's, it's pretty much the same, yeah? So we are the limited WIP society here. 
we know how great work in process, progress limits are, okay? Um, we all know these charts, we know um, Little's law, we know that we are, um, yeah, reducing the switching overhead, cycle time is going down if you're working in a whip limited system. Cost of delay, right? Uh, predictability increases, you know, work in process limits is just the best mankind ever invented, besides AC in the summer. So, but um, it's just awesome, right? So the point is, this company was limiting the work in process, but they didn't see the improvement. Why is this? And we, we see it here. They wanted to decrease um, or improve time to market, but time to market wasn't improved. Well, when it comes to work in progress limits, there is, I would say, some kind of fine print. And I think 99% of the companies most likely don't know this fine print. The fine print of work in progress limits is you need to limit these work items where you want to achieve the benefit of work in process limits. So work in progress limits are great, but you need to limit these items or entities in your uh, environment where you want to see the benefits. What does this mean? Let's take a look at this company. This is a square. <laughs> Sorry for this. Uh, seems like the projector uh, doesn't like my gray. So um, this company was working on initiatives. Imagine a big square here, OK? <laughs> uh, what they did is they broke up these initiatives into epics. Ah, wow. This gray is better. OK. Then they broke the epic into stories. There's another square, okay? <laughs> and then they broke stories into tasks. That's what they did, okay? So let's think what these guys were doing. They started this whole initiative on the team level. I, as a team, what can I limit? Where do I have access here? Story? Story? Task? Yeah? This is my area of influence. What was the goal in this organization? We want to improve time to market for initiatives or projects. So what do I need to limit? Initiatives, exactly. And that's what they didn't do. So don't be surprised if, don't be surprised if you don't see any improvement in time to market if you limit the wrong entity in your organization. You need to limit this entity where you want to see the improvement. This is initiatives or projects in this uh, case, in this organization. So where can I limit this? Hmm? At the portfolio level, exactly. And this is something which was not in place here. This organization limited um, tasks and stories on the team level, but they didn't do anything about uh, portfolio management. So there was no strategic portfolio management in place. This was my third finding in this organization. Does it make sense? Yeah? Okay, so I have one more uh, for you. The road to nowhere. Um, if we take a look at the change process, it's, let me say, interesting. Yeah? So the initial goal of this organization was we want to improve time to market market because we want to be more proactive, you know, exploit opportunities and so on and so on. So what did they do? They basically made the first derivative. Do I pronounce this correctly? Derivative? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so they did the first uh, derivative and the first derivative was go agile, right? So they did this huge agile transition with 600 um, teams involved. Then they built the second derivative, derivative, <laughs> Difficult word for me. Uh, they built the, the second derivative of Go Agile, which was we need agile teams. Yeah, and then they started to train Scrum masters, uh, product heroes, flow managers, whatever. Yeah, and what was the result? The result was the entire organization was discussing about something like roles. Uh, is it uh, is it allowed that the product owner joins the retrospective? I'm like, huh? <laughs> what are you guys talking about? So you wanted to improve time to market. And now you're talking about who's allowed to join what meeting. 
are you nuts? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this doesn't make any sense, right? So don't lose um, the, the thing that you, uh, that you actually want to achieve, right? We're talking about time to market. Does this bring us a step closer or not, right? So um, always focus to this um, initial step. Now I have, oh, this gray is working, perfect. So um, <laughs> what else? This organization was like, ah, we are such an ugly square. <laughs> this is our current state, but we want to be a fantastic star. That's our <laughs> desired state, okay? So what did they do? Well, they came up with a transformation plan. We talked about this before, right? I think that, that's, that's really my sense of humor. And, and there's, there's again, there's, there's an arrow, um, <laughs> which brings us, uh, this, this transformation plan brings us from the current state to the um, desired state. I think it's really, it's, it's strange. If you want to become agile, don't set up a traditional waterfall project, project for your change process. Gandhi already said, be the change that you wish to see, <laughs> right? <laughs> So practice what you preach. If you want to become agile, your whole transformation process needs to be agile, of course. Yeah? Um, if you take a look at this transformation plan, there was also one thing what I see in so many organizations. The very first part of each and every change focuses on the org chart. Yeah? So a good, or, uh, a good change project always starts with a reorganization, yeah? So in the first step, um, what we basically do is we move people around, yeah? David, could you please go to Alexis' team, yeah? Luis, you please join uh, Eric's team, yeah? So we, we basically move people around and then it's working. Because if everybody's just sitting on the right spot, it's working, yeah? The Spotify model. <laughs> it's just great, right? <laughs> so uh, if we just have these tribes, guilds, uh, squads, rots, rah, fantasy names, right? Then everything is great. I'm not sure, right? So there's not only the org chart, the organizational structure, there's also something like the operational structure. What does the operational structure mean? Well, we have something like an idea, a vision, a customer order, whatever. This comes into our system. This somehow flows through our organization, and in the end, we hopefully generated some value for the customer, right? That's um, the operational structure. Now, let's ask a question. How do you make money? Do you make money by moving people around, or do you make money by generating value for your customers. I think you're making money by generating value for your customers. So don't start a change project with a reorganization. Focus on your operational structure first. And maybe you discover, well, we are not so good in delivering value for our customer. Maybe it makes sense to change the organizational structure. But that's a second step, right? Focus on the, the operational structure because that's where money comes in. Changes in the organizational structure costs you money. Focus on the operational structure brings you money. You can make money with this. And this is also something that, um, yeah, this company was completely not present. So they really approached like this change to an agile organization with a classical waterfall change project and, yeah it didn't end up where they wanted to be. Does it make sense so far? Yeah? Very familiar, perfect. <laughs> yeah, so uh, these were basically the four findings uh, I made in this organization. There were some more, but I think for an hour talk, this is um, yeah, the major points. Now let's zoom in at the first one. So no management of interactions between teams. So um, yeah, I just didn't come to this company and said, okay, you did this wrong, goodbye. Um, <laughs> so um, I also helped them a little bit. So um, let's take a look at the first thing. How did we um, establish this management of interactions between teams? Well, remember, this was this chart. This was this dependency graph. So there were really a lot of dependencies between these uh, teams. So um, what did we do? Well, we basically built um, 
product boards. So we try to identify which team is working on what product, which is actually quite easy because one team is working on one product, right? But there are multiple teams working on one product. So let's assume these three teams, they are working together on one product. So what we did is we basically locked them for a day in a room and we asked them just a simple question. How are you guys working together? And the result was something like a product board. So the point here is again, do not optimize organizational structures. A team is an organizational structure, right? Focus on value delivery. In this organization, the product was the entity where uh, value is generated. Don't optimize organizational structure, optimize um, um, yeah, value delivery in the end. So the output was something like this. The teams built product boards. Like first they had three of these boards, now they have one board where you have um, yeah, the entire development process of these three teams on uh, the board. We still have external weighting here. External weighting means outside of the product, right? All other dependencies are now being managed on this board. So the board alone is, well, it's one thing, but we were talking about interactions. So we, need, we needed to set up some interactions, and that's what we did. Feedback loops. What we did is we did something like product stand-ups. Delegates from the teams met in front of this board, and they were having a stand-up meeting. We did retrospectives, improvement meetings on the product level. I see it so often that each and every team is improving, but we don't improve together. So again, we set up um, retrospectives on um, on the product level and, of course, replenishment and also some measurement so we could measure actually the performance uh, on the product level. Yeah? So if you come up with these product boards, you can reduce the number of dependency quite a lot actually. But there are still some dependencies remaining. These are the, the inter-product dependencies. Remember, the products weren't completely independent. If you change something in this product, you need to change something in that product. So there are still um, some dependencies remaining. How did we solve this problem? Well, we came up with something like an operative portfolio management. So we basically identified the um, dependencies among the products. And what we did is, in some areas, we came up with a new board, and in other areas, we just took these three boards, let's assume this is uh, where a lot of dependencies are, put these boards in one room and we came up with feedback loops again. Does that make sense? Yeah? Identify your dependencies, build a board, or if you already have the boards, take the, take the, boards, take the relevant boards to one uh, spot and then set up feedback loops. That's what we did here on the operative portfolio management. We did portfolio stand-up meetings. Delegates from the product were meeting in front of this board and they were having a conversation. And of course, they were talking a lot about dependencies because that's what's going on here, right? Um, yeah, we also set up retrospectives, which was also a very good move uh, in the end. So we improved the operative portfolio thinking and um, yeah, measurements, of course. So this was uh, the first thing. No management of interactions between teams. How did we solve it? We built boards where dependencies were, and then we managed these dependencies. And sooner or later, some dependencies disappeared because there was a reorganization going on, just a small reorganization. Like, if I go to this team, we could remove this dependency. Okay, so I should move to this team. But this was a learning process of the entire organization. And I think that's the important thing. We didn't uh, remove dependency because dependencies are evil. You cannot set up a company without dependencies. There will always be dependencies. You need to manage them. Manage them by making them visible, bring the right people in front of the board, and set up feedback loops so that people talk about these dependencies. That's what we did um, for these interactions between teams. No end-to-end -end management of the value creation chain. So this monitor just went away. Um, what was this? Well, um, 
Remember, this was this very long process. So what we did in the end, we shortened the process. And it sounds so, I mean, I can only show you this slide. But the process behind it was more than a year. Because this was a very traditional organization. Uh, they, they had business, and then there was IT, right? So you need to bring these two parts together. And this is change. So the technical solution, the board, is easy. Yeah? But the change process behind it, that's not really um, an easy thing to do. So we shortened the process here. They're only writing a rough concept. And this concept is already waiting for approval. And this approval is done bi-weekly. And I think that's the real big lever if you can shorten this down, not twice a year, but uh, every second week. This makes a difference. So whenever it comes to um, improving agility, it's a lot about replenishment. I see it so often that we have agile teams, but we still have a yearly budget. Not sure. <laughs> so a yearly budget means you're replenishing the work for one year, and then you are doing some kind of agile magic in between. But uh, yeah, <laughs> not a good point, right? So agility is a lot about. Um, shortening uh, replenishment cycles. Yeah, so not much to say here, um, except, of course, you can probably already um, know it. Uh, it's not only about the board. You also need to set up um, feedback loops. So when we did these stand-up meetings before, we basically brought business on board. So we were having the stand-up meeting together with business. We were doing replenishment meeting, uh, sorry, um, retrospectives, improvement meetings together with the business. And we measured end-to-end, -end, from idea to impact in the end. Yeah. So this was uh, the second thing, end-to-end -end management of the value creation chain. Um, and it's really a change topic, especially if you're talking about uh, a traditional uh, organization. because. Guess what's going on on the business parts? They have silos there. Yeah, and you need to break the silos on the business part. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's the same what you did before uh, on the IT part. You can do the same uh, on the business part then. Yeah? What else? Um, no strategic portfolio management. Well, um, in the end, it's quite easy. We came up with a strategic portfolio board. Um, it's easy like this. So um, in the beginning, the board looked a little bit different, so that's already um, another iteration, what you see here. So the very simple form of this board is they were like, OK, what is the main things that we're doing? And they were like, OK, we are making money, and we're investing money. So we're doing investments, and we're making money. So we're talking about the strategic portfolio. So we need to have some strategy somewhere. So we built something like an information radiator in front of the board where the company strategy was visible for the entire company. What we did is we broke down the strategy into business metrics. Business metrics is like, okay, um, we need to, I don't know, uh, business metrics. <laughs> uh, what would be an example in this? Uh, increase the number of sales in America, in the US, or something like this. Yeah? So break it down to, to business metrics. And then the idea is, whenever you have work in this part uh, of the board, it needs to turn one of these business metrics. If it's turning one of the business metrics, you are uh, aligned to the strategy. So that was the basic mechanism behind it. And then we came up with um, yeah, some kind of flow, how, um, how we are doing this. This. Another thing, that's why I say it's not the first iteration. Um, the last column is not done. The last column is impact achieved or impact not achieved. So we were totally strict about not about improving output, but outcome. So whenever we developed something, so it was in development, it wasn't done, we were in a state like measure success and tweak. So the feature was on the market. And uh, we tracked, basically, if the business metric is turning in this direction where we want to have it. If not, we need to tweak it. And uh, the other thing is not more than 90 days from here, next top five evaluated ideas to measure success and tweak, less than 90 days. 
that's quite challenging uh, on this level. And then maybe uh, we didn't achieve the impact, but we were like, okay, if we tweak it a little bit more, we could achieve it. So there was an optional column, like adapt and tweak, where you could go in, uh, where, you can, where you could add another 90 days, actually, to uh, achieve the impact or not. The other thing was, I really like this, if you did not achieve the impact, we took the feature out of the software, which is a good thing to do, right? Because uh, if there's a feature in the software and it doesn't, yeah, pay in for the, for the impact, you need to maintain it, all the test cases are on it, and so on and so on. So we basically took it out. And there were quite some interesting discussions going on, because <laughs> imagine, uh, we, so each and every um, yeah, work item here needs to say which business metric uh, is influenced, right? So let's say this feature influences a business metric by 10%, but it only influences it by 4%, do we take it out? But it's 4%, 4% means 4% more income. So what do you do? It's a good conversation to have, right? So um, yeah, this was really fun in the end. Um, yeah, so this, this is uh, a sketch of the uh, portfolio board. Um, and of course, the board alone doesn't make a good feedback loop. Uh, yeah, you need feedback loops. So we did stand up meetings. Uh, also on the strategic portfolio level. In the beginning, they were like, okay, let's have this stand-up meeting twice a year. I was like, mm, I would say weekly. <laughs> they were like, mm, <laughs> no, I can't imagine. But from the second meeting, already took place one week after the first meeting. So if you really um, yeah, slice the item small enough, and if you really focus about outcome and not output, you will have a lot to discuss also on this level. Yeah, uh, yeah. stand-up meetings, uh, and we also did strategy reviews. So we deep dived into uh, Wardley mapping. You probably heard about it. So we also challenged uh, the strategy um, all the time, of course. Yeah, so this was strategic portfolio management. Yeah, I think that's a very important thing. And we had a fantastic talk today um, by Nick and Fred, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, really great. Um, they did it, uh, strategic portfolio management in uh, government uh, environment, which I think is really challenging. And they had really success with it. Very great. So one more thing is here, waterfall-like change process for an agile transition. Um, I don't want to talk too much about it. Gandhi is so right. Be the change that you want to see. And that's what we did um, here. So often it's like, okay, we as top management, we want that our organization is becoming agile, so become agile. Yeah, this has nothing to do with us. It has a lot to do with top management, right? So um, yeah, we basically, yeah, top management acted as a role model, more or less, for this um, transformation, starting from this uh, point on. And I think that's really important. All right, so these were the four things we did in this company. End-to-end -end management, uh, strategic portfolio management, interactions between teams. So if you take a look at these um, yeah, bullet points here, I think I can say something like business agility is no team sport. Business agility is corporate sport. You need to have the entire organization on board, otherwise it's really hard. But if it's corporate sport, where in an organization can I do something? So we were talking about portfolio, we were talking about teams. So where in an organization can you do something? Well, there's a model which I call the flight levels. And flight levels mm, helps me actually understand where in an organizational context I can change something in order to reach the desired outcome that I want to see. Yeah? So flight level is a term from aviation, the higher you're flying the more you see, but you don't see a lot of details. And if you fly lower, you see a lot of details, but you don't see that much, yeah? Um, so you can do something on flight level one, and flight level one is the operational level. People that are working, act doing actually work, yeah? Often you see more than only one team in an organization, and that's why there are multiple flight level one 
supports services uh, in your organization. That's again gray, just for your information. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what we have also seen is that there are dependencies between teams, so we need to fly one level higher. This is flight level two, where we hopefully have something like end-to-end -end coordination of the system. Remember, this is the keyboard. We make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time. And nobody is working on a flight level two. It's a coordination level. Work is being done here, but we need coordination work going on. Um, so that we make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time. Uh, what you can do is, you can connect these flight levels, of course, which makes sense, right? Uh, often you have more than only one value stream in your organization. Maybe you have multiple products, multiple projects, whatever. So you can see multiple of these flight level two systems in a system, uh, in an organization, I mean. It's also often the case that you find dependencies between these um, value chains what you do is you build something like an operative portfolio. Operative portfolio is you identify these um, yeah, products, whatever, with dependencies, and you set up a feedback loop to manage these dependencies. Maybe you need to draw a board for it or come up with a, with a, with a camping system, or you just take your uh, other flight level two systems in one room and you set up the feedback loop. That's it. Often... Um, or not often, always, actually, you also need to fly a little bit higher, which is flight level three, and flight level three is the strategic portfolio level. On the strategic portfolio level, what you're doing is, you are basically doing strategy work, so you are aligning the entire work in your organization on the strategy. That's the idea. And, of course, you can connect these boards, and especially in larger organizations, what we see quite often is, that you not only have one flight level three system, but you have multiple flight level three system systems. So I used to work for Bosch, for instance, and you know Bosch in this environment was 24,000 people roughly, and they were in Germany, in India, in America, and China, and somewhere else. And of course, the Chinese strategy is different from the German strategy. So we built different of these flight level three systems on different locations. Um, and there was also some kind of hierarchy involved, yeah? So this is the flight levels. And again, everything is grayish here, yeah? <laughs> um, for me, flight levels is not something like a maturity model. For me, it's a communication model. So I wouldn't say flight level three is three times better than flight level one. For me, it solves a different problem, right? On flight level one, the problem is to deliver. If teams are not delivering, you can take the best strategic decisions you can imagine, teams won't deliver, yeah? The other thing is, if you want to improve time to market, you can agilize and do whatever you want on the team level. That's the wrong lever. You need to do it on flight level three because you need to limit the entire work in your organization. And that's why I think flight levels is a good thing to have because you can start a, con a communication. You can start a conversation. Where in the organization do we need to change what so that we get the desired output? Yeah? And you can start anywhere and go to another flight level. All right, so this is the flight levels. Um, if you have something, if you don't have anything to do on Wednesday afternoon, I'm running a workshop with these flight levels. So we are mapping organizations uh, to um, yeah, boards like systems like this. So um, yeah, if you're bored, maybe you can join the workshop <laughs> in the afternoon. So let me wrap this up. Um, Two more slides and then we're done. Uh, how would you start from, from scratch? So the story I was telling is um, there was this um, transformation already going on. But what if someone or some organization wants to start from scratch um, and you, are, you didn't start on a team level in the first place? So how could you start on scratch? I think there are two approaches. Depends on who you are. One approach is you are maybe a consulting company. <laughs> And as a consulting company, you want to earn a lot of money, but you don't care a lot about outcome or output. Yeah, Sounds maybe a little bit weird, but I think there's a real market for something like this. Yeah, So I know there are a lot of companies who are like, ah, oh, we want to become agile, but nothing has to change. 
Yeah? <laughs> so there's a huge market uh, for uh, something like this. Um, yeah, what you could do is start on the team level, of course. Do as many agile teams as you get because that's a lot of training. <laughs> that's really a lot of training you, you, you could do. Yeah? Um, Sub-optimize all the teams and yeah, follow your agile method by the book. That's really a safe way to burn loads of money. <laughs> oh, sorry, there's a typo. <laughs> My fault. <laughs> Didn't see it. Um, so <laughs> that's one approach. <laughs> there's a second approach, and the second approach is, well, maybe you are an economically minded um, company, and you really want to achieve an impact. And I think it's easy like this. In the beginning, you only need one agile team, and this is top management. Yeah? Be the change that you want to see. Yeah? Start from top. Top management um, yeah, serves as a role model. We don't push the change into the organization, but we lift the change that we want to see. And then, uh, yeah, we start at a strategic portfolio and go down the flight levels. And in the first step, we limit the entire work in the organization. Yeah? And another thing is, I think you're good if you kill all these agile methods and framework, frameworks. That's good for consulting companies. But in the end, you are allowed to think. You need to understand how your system works. And it's not about implementing whatever, scrum, save, less, more, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's really about understanding what you're doing. And yeah, be the best at getting better. I think that's what we need to do. And then. Everything will be fine. Thank you. <laughs> That's it. Thank you, Klaus. That was